It's a great pleasure to introduce Jen Germain. Hi. Hi, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about um, it, main focus will be on your PhD and your work ar uh, around weight loss drugs. Um, how, how did you how do you, do you become involved in it? What, what, what made you interested in the topic area? Uh, well, I've always been interested in body image and eating behaviours. I studied psychology for my undergrad and research methods in psychology for my master's. And even then, I was always more, mostly interested in body image, nutrition, eating behaviours. Um, my undergraduate dissertation looked at food intake during the menstrual cycle. And my master's looked at how parental eating practices could influence food neophobia and fruit and vegetable intake in children. So I'd always had this kind of interest. And then I started working within public health and nothing to do with enhancement drugs or body image or weight loss drugs in completely different disciplines. But I was really interested in the work gym within the human enhancement drugs field. And I think you'd asked me at one point to proof a report you were doing on enhancement drugs. And I just found it so interesting and I thought this is a field I'd really like to move into. So when the PhD studentship was advertised in this area, I decided to apply. I'm um, slightly worried that it might have too much of a steroid focus for me, but I thought I'd give it a shot anyway. And luckily enough, I came up with an idea that yourself and the other examiners and the other supervisors liked. Uh, yeah, you, you certainly since I made it your own. We didn't have any preconceived ideas about going into that that particular area. And um, so, so tell us about it. What what methods did you use, and what was your sort of research question? So I was really looking at the use of unlicensed weight loss drugs in women. So particularly focusing on the fat burner, two four down in trophenol or DMP, and ribonavant and subutramine, which are both appetite suppressants. And there's not a huge amount of research in this area, and but that, that does exist, focus on male use and bodybuilding communities. But I could see from online discussion that there was quite a lot of ex people online who were female who were discussing their use and their experiences. So I thought with a lot of the discussion being online, I'd take my research online. So it was a large study of 10 online forums interviews with forum moderators, and then interviews with female weight loss drug users. And I suppose people only see like the end product of it, but I mean, to me, which was so impressive with the amount of work that went in, into identifying and picking those uh, particular um, sites and that, uh, there was a massive amount of work in that, wasn't there? It was, it took a long time. Um, I kind of used an approach similar to if you were doing a systematic review. So I identified keywords to find the communities. I had an inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I think I started off with around 400 forums. And then based on that criteria, whittled it down to the 10 that I was interested in. I also used some tools to look to see whether I could identify forums that had a high female presence were UK based forums and obviously were discussing the drugs that I was interested in. And I also wanted to make sure that the forums were open. So you might need a registration in order to post, but you didn't need a registration in order to access. And that was really just for the communities themselves in that if content is that hidden, I feel like there's going to be a reluctance to be involved in research. And obviously in this type of research, you're not really giving the users a choice. So I went for open communities. So yeah, it was it was quite a long process. It took a number of months to, to get through. And uh, as you say, there isn't a great deal of research around this. And considering what we we know uh, about the, the, the numbers of people with concerns about their weight and who are taking supplements, it, it's quite amazing, really, the, the lack of um, evidence out there. Um, so, so you focused on these three particular drugs and um, just for those people who don't know, what are the difference between those drugs and are, are the differences in risks and um, uh, how popular they may be? Yeah, so DMP, which is a, the fat burner, is probably the most, well, definitely the most toxic of the three drugs. And it's got a really narrow therapeutic window, which means the kind of acceptable amount between its therapeutic dose and its dose, which could be toxic, is, is really small. 
Um, it was a drug that was previously used way back in the 1930s, but was then withdrawn due to risks and harms being identified. Um, number of number of conditions relating to it, and obviously some people did die from taking it. Kind of growth of the internet has sort of made it available and accessible again, and people have started using it, most notably in bodybuilding communities. Ramonaband and Subutramine were both previously licensed appetite suppressants. So if you'd gone to your GP kind of prior to 2010 looking for an appetite suppressant, you may have been prescribed one of these. But Subutramine was linked to heart conditions and Ramonaband to psychiatric disorders. So they were both withdrawn from the market, but are still readily available to purchase online. Great, thanks. And you, you, you touched on over your approach uh, to do with uh, forums and you touched on, uh, I suppose, some of the ethical issues and the timing of this is such that I suppose it, it, it came, it, the, the analysis rapidly gained favour and then concerns were, were raised about it. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I came into it quite naively, really, thinking that because it was publicly available information, I wasn't even sure if I needed ethical approval. And the original reason that I went to the ethics committee was because I spoke to the chair at the time who said that if I was looking to publish my findings, it would be good to say that I had ethical approval, but she didn't see think there would be any issues with it. So I submitted the application thinking all would be fine. It's, it's online information, anyone can access it. And the ethics committee came back with a number of concerns. So it was around the idea of, am I using closed or open forums? you're using people's words in a way that they haven't consented for their words to be used. If I've got potentially people who might be engaging in illicit activity, if you Google search their quote, could you find their profile and potentially link it to an individual? So there are a lot of kind of ethical dilemmas along the way. And this kind of encouraged me to find other researchers who were conducting similar types of research. And we actually formed a, an online methods research group and publish some papers on some of those ethical some of those ethical considerations. And I think the British Psychological Society do publish guidance on conducting internet mediated research, but I think it needs to be a really flexible approach. I think anyone who's doing research of this type does need to consider what the risks may be to the participants and obviously alter their research accordingly. There's no kind of one size fits all model to it. And I think the BPS acknowledged that in their guidance as well. Yeah, that was one of the things that I found really interesting about your PhD was that extra dimension of the the, the timing in relation to the uh, the growth and the, uh, and the changing acceptance of, of the methodology, which I found particularly interesting. Um, tell us about what you found then uh, and what your, your conclusions are around uh, the whole issue. Well, I mean, one of the biggest findings, I guess, was that women do use these products, um, although they're under researched and, and not talked about a great deal in the literature, they do use these products. One of the biggest findings, I guess, really was where women go to for advice on using these products, because quite often on the online forums, they seem really as the novice users. Um, Quite often when they're asking for advice on what dosage they should be taking or what their strategy should be, they're sort of shouted down, particularly with DMP, and told that this isn't a drug for them, they shouldn't be messing with it, it's for men, it's for bodybuilders, it's not for them. And in some cases they they, they may be right, it may not be the drugs, may not be drugs that they should be messing with, but I think then this leads to a worry about what those women then do. Do they go and take the drug anyway? Um, are they using? Are they going to follow guidance from male norm models on the forums, which may not be suitable for them and may cause them harm? So I think that's really kind of one of the biggest findings is we do have this population that are using, but don't have uh, the same space to discuss their use in the same way that that men and bodybuilders do. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important point. I, I, I suppose on, on the other two drugs, which are, I suppose the, all the evidence indicates that they are not as harmful, but they, they, you know, they were removed uh, from licensing for uh, a reason. Um, it tells us a bit about that. And I suppose the irony around the fact that they were removed from being a licensed product because they weren't safe and yet now people are using them with no medical interventions whatsoever. 
Yeah, definitely. And I think that obviously makes it even worse because obviously those risks are still evident in those drugs, but there's even more risks now because they're taken without the supervision of a healthcare professional. So um, subutramine, for example, if taken alongside certain SSRI antidepressants can have a really negative effect in that too much serotonin is produced, which obviously a doctor would look at your medical history and would see that you're prescribed that drug, so would not have prescribed you subutramine. So it's it's really this idea that removal of license doesn't stop use and the kind of globalised access that we have through the internet means that you can purchase anything. I mean, there are forums that exist, such as Blue Light, which does have kind of academic and healthcare professionals on board, so they will kind of offer expertise. But unless you know which forum to go to to get that advice, you could be potentially be taking something that is dangerous, has been removed for a reason, and could be even more dangerous due to other things that you're taking. I think for me, one of the biggest things is if you don't have an understanding of weight loss drugs, but you're interested in using them, and you kind of look at online markets and try and find one for you, you could stumble across a herbal weight loss product, which is probably not going to do very much, probably not going to lose much weight, but it's probably not going to do you very much harm. Or but you could inadvertently stumble across something that's far more toxic and far more dangerous without even really realising it. Yeah, and I suppose it, now your, your PhD is done, you've uh, published on the back of it. I, where would you like to see the research go or maybe beyond the research or around interventions? It's a tricky one and it's something I've been thinking about more as I'm publishing more from, from the work. I think for me, I think that there needs to be more research with women and we really need to look at whether we're going to take a purely preventative approach or whether we are going to look at harm reduction and kind of accepting that we know that telling people to not use something doesn't always work. So how can we reduce harm? And I think for me, it's around involving peers in terms of offering peer support, because as I was told at one point during my PhD by a forum moderator, they're not going to listen to the likes of me, a flabby researcher. They're going to listen to the person who's got that body, who's got that aesthetic that those women and other users aspire to. So I think for me, it's really around kind of delivering that peer education and how we can not encourage people to use, but if they're going to use, inform them how to use as safely as possible. Thanks. And while you're not sort of engaged in research in, in this particular area, it, areas of your work is around pre-exposure prophylaxis. T tell us a bit about that and is, is that another form of enhancement drugs? Yeah, I think so. So we were recently commissioned to do a project looking at PrEP and um, it was before it was rolled out um, as part of prescription. So it was looking at the the impact trial and what the effects have been at that. So, so tell us a bit about that for people who don't know uh, so what about PrEP is. PrEP is a drug that people take who may be engaging in risky sex to and uh, reduce the risk of contracting HIV. So it's a drug to prevent them them contracting HIV. Is that enough? And, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's fine. Uh, and I suppose in, in some ways it, it could be perceived it, it's facilitating, I suppose it, it could be seen as facilitating a behaviour. I mean it could be I mean, so we part of the study we interviewed around 20 men who have sex with men and around 15 healthcare professionals to look to see kind of firstly the accessibility and availability of PrEP because it was still just on a trial at that moment so to see are they able to get it what are some of the practical issues around getting it and then also for them who were on the trial what how this had impacted them so there was an argument to be said that it may encourage kind of changes in sexual behavior I think for our participants what we found was that they were able to enjoy sex without a worry so it actually it enhanced their sex life so if they're going to chem sex parties and going to engage in what we might deem as risky sex anyway but in but by taking prep it allowed them to do it without the same concerns that they would have had previously right that, that's great well th thanks very much uh, for for that and giving us a, a sort of window into your phd and your ongoing work so thanks very much jen no worries at all. Thank you. Thanks.